will be the National Rally Championship. Today, round three, the Rally of Otago. A cool, clear morning greeted competitors in the Shoreline Hotel Otago Rally. Round three in the National Rally Championships and the first event to use the new two-heat format. Number one seed and current points leader and last year's Otago champion was Palmerston North's Jeff Argyle in his Falcon Tires Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 4. Oh, there's probably six or seven cars behind us that are capable of doing really, really well. With these fast roads, it's very hard to pull out very big margins, even if we're early try, so we're just going to try and be consistent, especially through the first half of the day, today and then see what happens after that. Three-time national champion Joe McAndrew was hoping for a trouble-free run. The second seed for this event was still looking for his first championship point. Um, oh, I expect Jeffrey, he's the number one seed, and um, yeah, Rosenberg behind us, even though he's Group N car, he's still going, got a pretty quick car there as well. Um, but yeah, the locals, um, West and Stokes, will probably do pretty good down here as well, I'd say. Seated sixth in another Mitsubishi Evo 4 was Manawatu's Bruce Herbert and Rob Ryan. The Palmerston North driver was considered by many to be the dark horse of the field. The mainland's hopes rested squarely on the broad shoulders of Brian Stokes and his Ford Escort Cosworth. Having won in Marlborough, the Canterbury farmer was on a roll. Auckland's Marty Rustenberg in the Rally Art Mobile One Mitsubishi was expected to lead Group N. Out in just round two at Gisborne, the Flying Maori was out for revenge. There's sort of two trains of thought. One is to, to go really hard and fast because it's a sprint rally and there's only six stages in each rally. The other is to just be a little bit conservative and make sure that you get points from both days. So I think we'll go as fast as we can, but um, try not to risk too much. So you know, if we can stick to that game plan, then hopefully it'll be OK for us. 23-year-old rookie Chris West from Timaru was another contender for Group N honours in his number nine Mitsubishi. Um, key for today is mainly to... Um, Sort of suss out the pace with the national championship guys, with the likes of um, Todd and Marty and um, Stumpy and Ross, and um, sort of just pick a wee spot that we can sit in quite comfortably and, and uh, hopefully come home for some good points. Keeping West honest all the way would be Hibiscus Coast driver Todd Borden and yet another Mitsubishi Evolution 4. The New Zealand Rally Champs kicked off for the North Island contingent with the Gisborne Rally. First to leave the start ramp was Joe McAndrew's Fleet Link Subaru. His race only lasting two stages before gearbox problems forced him out. Another early casualty was Auckland's Marty Rostenberg. Power steering problems contributing to his demise also on stage two. This left the way clear for Jeff Argyle and Brendan Locke. After a disappointing 97 campaign plagued with mechanical problems, this was the start the Falcon Tires teams were looking for. Made all the more notable as it was co-driver's Locke's first rally. South Island competitors travelled to the beautiful vineyard country of Marlborough for their championship round. Rookie sensation Chris West in his Mitsubishi came within a hair's breadth of winning his first ever national championship round, winning all five stages in the opening half and controlling the final stages as well, before a hidden rock cost him valuable time. This left the door open for Brian Stokes, double national champion in his Escort Cosworth, to take his first win of the season by just six seconds. And so to the Rally of Otago, combining both North and South Island competitors, but unlike previous national rounds, run over a two-heat format. Each day treated as a separate heat with points allocated for each day's competition. Heat one consisted of six stages, with the rally centred around the gold-rich town of Lawrence. First on the road and setting a quick pace was the Falcon Tires Mitsubishi of Jeff Argyle and Brendan Locke. Second quickest in this, the first stage, the Falcon team then got serious and with a car to beat on stages two, three and four. Joe McAndrew and Christopher Boyle were quickest over stage one over the Waipuri Gorge, but then lost valuable seconds to Argyle in the next three stages. Frustrated with a lack of power, Joe was surprised by Argyle's early pace. Yes, has been going pretty good in the last two. Uh, seems to go and remember the roads pretty well. And um, yeah, no, he's pulling away 
bit of time there. Marty Rustenberg had picked up a mechanical gremlin in the Mitsubishi and by the service and regroup after four was sixth overall. It uh, looks as though some of the other Group N guys are going really quick. Todd Borden put in some, some great times um, three stages ago. Also setting top ten stage times was Ross Meekings and Alan Glenn in the NZ Lancer. Definitely a horsepower type track. Certainly those last two stages were horsepower orientated type tracks. Either that or it would be handy to know where you're going. You know? <laughs> We ride with a man that did know where he was going, Timaru's Chris West. Constantly in the top five stage times overall, and after the regroup after stage four, was sitting in third place. Carrying good form from his near miss in Marlborough, Chris West was easily leading Group N. successful and consistent start to the Otago Rally for Chris West. Yeah, no, we're just um, we're taking our time, just slowing down over those brows and um, good road, so. So I'm not too sure how the times are going, but um, they were reasonably happy anyway. Good speed, good safe speed, so. Yeah. Someone that wasn't setting a good speed was Brian Stokes, who had picked up a mysterious engine miss in his case IH Ag Shop Ford Escort dropping him well out of the top ten. Oh, we broke a wire onto the uh, back of the alternator right on the start of the first special stage and the voltage went down and it just started misfiring straight away, obviously. So we uh, fixed that between the stages, but we clocked in quite late, so we got a, quite a lot of penalties. Then it's just been a, just a bit of a drive, really. Yeah, nothing very spectacular at all. Andrew Hawkeswood, who is kept sharp in the off-season by driving Speedway Midgets, was always spectacular, making up for a lack of turbo boost with some Demon Lake braking and aggressive cornering technique. Yeah, we lost the turbo on the first stage, about 4 k's in, so it's pretty much screwed today, but... Um, we lost a lot of time in the next stage as well because we had to drive through with no turbo. Um, we had to stop and put a um, bang the, take the sump guard off and bang the return line flat because it was sucking the oil out of the sump. And uh, yeah, we had a bit of a tyre selection problem. And I've learned a lot today about the South Island, that's for sure. So the results after stage four sees Jeff Argyle in front, 50 seconds behind him, Joe McAndrew, and in third place, Bruce Herbert. In group N, it was Chris West. Brian Green made everyone stand up and take notice when he debuted his ex-works Ford Escort World Rally car, rumoured to be worth $700,000. Well, it's an, it's an awesome car. I've been in a lot of cars over the years. Um, it's, it just does everything dead right. And um, the, the most most impressive thing is the way it stops. You, um, the moment you touch the brakes, the, it automatically locks the transmission all up with the brakes, and the whole thing just stops just so fast. The traction's unbelievable, and over the bumps, you just, you just don't even realise how rough the road is. We don't have many spares or anything with us here today because all of those are still on their way from England. Um, the crew have also got a big job to do. They've never worked on anything as sophisticated as this. And um, I'm very impressed with all the work that they've done to get us to where we are here today. Well, the moment you go to change gears in the car and you touch the, and you just touch the gear lever, it automatically retards the ignition so you can't over rev it. Um, the moment you put the accelerator down, one computer system locks the whole car up so all the wheels are working in the same direction. And the moment you touch the brakes, the opposite thing happens. Everything's in, 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 in a slowdown mode. Uh, it's just a quick stop, the way it's going, you know, it's um, never a dull moment. You all right, George? Yeah. And never a dull moment for the service crews either. Making his New Zealand debut on the rally scene was the factory-backed Citroen Saxo team. It was all hands to the pumps, wheels or whatever at a busy service point at Lawrence. But sooner or later it was back to business as usual for Jeff Argyle, who'd wowed the fans with a 32-second record over stage four, and already quickly back into his work on five. 
By stage six, the tide had started to turn, with McAndrew and Argyle splitting the win over the 11.5k Forry Flat in 7.36. Third in Group A and fifth overall was Bruce Herbert and Robert Ryan. They were 10 seconds off the pace set by the leaders on six, but they were still giving it everything. So at the end of day one, heat one, it was Jeff Argyle and the Mitsubishi in the front of the field. Joe McAndrew was second and Bruce Herbert third. It was just the start Argyle was looking for. Too bad, you know. Real bit problems with the car at all, it's run sweet. Other than losing those brakes in the first couple of stages, so it's going good. The battle for Group N couldn't have been any closer. Just two seconds separating the mainland's Chris West from Auckland's Todd Borden. It is in fact West, MS give a chair, Borden, in his newer Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 4, had beaten West by just one second on stage six. Aucklander Marty Rustenberg, still battling mechanical problems, was now back in third place, over 30 seconds adrift of the scintillating pace of Chris West. Hamilton's Ross Meekings in the NZ Mitsubishi Lancer was now in fourth and his spectacular style was thrilling the crowds in the forest. And so to the Group N results after Heat 1, Chris West the leader, just by the barest of margin, Todd Borden in second, Rustenberg in third and Meekings in fourth. I'm quite comfortable at the moment with this pace, it's um, pretty safe so uh, yeah, I'm quite happy. See how it goes. The battle for Formula 2, the two-wheel drive cars, was a battle of youth versus experience. David Black and his Nissan Almera providing the experience. And Justin Julian providing the youthful exuberance. At the end of day one, Julian's Toyota led the new Nissan by nine seconds. Oh, I just love the sport, mate, and having a good five-day black like that just makes sport that much more enjoyable, eh? I'm day stoked day. about that. Pretty day strong. I, I had, um, had luck and blew his motor. Had his bonnet up anyway, and um, yeah, so lost him in the battle, but now it's a good day. Excellent. Yeah. Always a popular class, the one-make Suzuki Baleno Cup cars were fiercely competitive. Stu Warren in his two-door model holding a 15-second advantage over fellow Cantabrian Dean Buist. Interestingly, Buist picked a four-door model. He said that it gave him more traction, but he was still a distant second place. In third, it was Auckland's evergreen, Grant Liston. The Shoreline Hotel, Rally of Otago. First on the road was first heat winner, Jeff Argyle. Stage 7 wasn't to be the banner start that the Falcon Tyres team wanted, with a brake problem dropping them down the stage finished to just 4th overall. We ride on board now with Jeff Argyle and the Falcon Tyres Mitsubishi, and a couple of things to notice. One, just how quickly the car accelerates, and two, the fact that Argyle drives without gloves. He says he wants to feel the road. If stage seven wasn't what the team ordered, then stage eight certainly wasn't. Things were about to go from bad to worse. This little spin in eight, costing Argyle and the team a valuable 20 seconds.
was first on the road, Argyle knew that the spin would put him further down the order. The decision to up the turbo boost on the Fleet Link Subaru wasn't the only thing on Joe McAndrew's mind as he headed off the line at stage seven. He knew somehow he had to win the second heat or day two to have any chance of the overall win. We're right here with McAndrew and Boyle through the Akatori Forest, stage seven, and look at the speed of the Fleet Link Subaru. Third quickest in seven wasn't going to be good enough. It was time for McAndrew and co to up the ante. Once again, we ride on board with Joe McAndrew. This is stage eight through the Tyree Beach stage. McAndrew ever so casual, one-hander and off the road and that's six feet down the bank and you'll see the co-driver, he thinks that the rally's over and starts to unbuckle. No problems though for Joe McAndrew, fires up the car and uses the Subaru all-wheel drive to get back into the race. That little mishap cost McAndrew 30 seconds, but he would still finish first on stage eight, seven seconds up on Chris West. One of the big improvers on the second day after fitting a new engine management chip was Bruce Herbert and Robert Ryan. With solid performances in stage seven and eight, they were now fourth overall. With the Case Ag and Turf Escort back on four cylinders, Ryan Stokes had taken his place at the top of the field. He was now second. Still leading Group N was Chris West and Richard Brown in their trendy Mitsubishi Lancer. Their dream drive continued. Fifth equal with Todd Borden in stage seven, they knew that the Auckland challenge wouldn't be diminished. The sensation of heat two had to be Andrew Hawkeswood and Gary Payne in the Sonic Automotive driving sound Mitsubishi Lancer. Fastest overall in stage seven and five seconds up on Stokes, they kept the momentum up and were third overall after stage eight. Hibiscus Coast Todd Borden had a minor setback through eight, but recovered to seventh overall, third in Group N, heading into Stage 9. The F2 battle continued with David Black and Tony Amos Nissen, 18th overall, and now 12 seconds up on their nearest rival, Justin Julian and Shane Farmer in the Toyota. But then, halfway through Stage 8, this. delight on the face of Justin Julian when he came over the blind brow and saw his major competition out of the shoreline rally. Just, uh, she was greasy on the inside and the old front wheel drive. At least she got it set up right. I just Backed off a bit much. She's a mess. Never mind. It'll be another day. Another battle that was still a bit of a mess was the Suzuki's. Stu Warren and Mel Preston, after stage eight, lay in 25th overall, but first in class. Four places and 10 seconds up on Buist and Buist of Canterbury.
So at the midpoint in heat two, in Group A, Joe McAndrew, now the race leader from Brian Stokes and Andrew Hawkswood, while in Group N, Chris West holds on to the advantage from Todd Borden and Meekings. Also taking part in the Shoreline Otago Rally were the Classics. It was great to see some of the stars of years past out on the road and having fun. She forgot all about the library like she told her old man now. And with the radio blasting, goes cruising just as fast as she can now. And she'll have fun, fun, fun till her daddy takes a tea bird away. Fun, fun, fun till her daddy takes a tea bird away. Well, girls can't stand her cause she walks, looks and cries like an ace. You walk like an ace now, you walk like an ace. She makes it easy by her, look like a Roman cherry in face. By stage nine, the rally was heating up in more ways than one. When Chris West went out and his hot exhaust set the surrounding scrub on fire, the officials decided to cancel the stage. By ten, it was business as usual. Although overall leader McAndrew was charging along with Brian Stokes, it was a restored Argyle who set the fastest time. Chris West, now in a decidedly second-hand looking Lancer, was still holding second spot in Group N. After setting fastest time in the disallowed stage nine, this disaster put Hawkswood out of the rally. The final roll of the dice was a publicity stage by the old Anzac Road overbridge, the 2K stage providing a fitting ending to the Shoreline Hotel Rally of Otago. Easily the most spectacular was Smokin' Joe McAndrew more than living up to his name. on the final stage was the NZ Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 4 of Ross Meekings. He put up a 1 minute 36 effort. Also putting on a good show was Brian Green in the ex Yuha Kankanen Works Escort. The Hard Luck Award probably should have gone to Timaru's Chris West, who was reduced to two-wheel drive after problems in Stage 11. He lost valuable seconds and vital parts. So the overall result for the Rally of Otago, Joe McAndrew taking the win from Jeff Argyle and Bruce Herbert in Group A, while in Group N, Chris West takes the win from Todd Borden and Ross Meekings. We read a fire and looks like the championship's going to be really opened up with... Um, Jeff going really good and Stokes he's even going good as well, you know, Westful and unbelievable for young fella to come through and Bowden. So yeah, we've got a really good championship shaping up now. It's gonna really go good. Jesus built my car. It's a love affair. Joe McAndrew's win in the second heat really opens up the National Rally Championship. McAndrew holding fifth spot overall, just three points behind Brian Stokes in the board and 12 behind Jeff Argyle in the Mitsubishi. And while we're talking rally, Possum Bourne is having an amazing run across the Tasman in the Australian Rally Championship. He's gone a long way to winning his third consecutive driver's title. His latest win was in the Queensland event. With just two events to go, Bourne can afford a couple of average finishes and still take the title. Coming next, Rally of Southland.